In Peru, thousands of Aymara people from the Puno region arrived in the capital city to continue the protests demanding the resignation of President Dina Boluarte and the closure of the Congress. Antigua and Barbuda holds legislative elections to renew the Senate and the House of Representatives. Ukraine's National Police confirmed that Interior Minister Denis Munavstryskiv and other Syrian officials were killed in a helicopter crash in the city of Brovary in Kiev. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. And now we begin. On Wednesday in Peru, thousands of Aymaras from the Puno region arrive in Lima to join the protests demanding the resignation of President Dina Boluarte and the closure of the Congress. About 7,000 Aymara people traveled to the capital city to make their demands heard. On their way to Lima, they received the support of the Peruvian people, who provided them with food, drinks, and even money, hoping they will be able to achieve their political purpose. Jose Colque Mamani, the leader of the Indian region, said they will not return until the president had resigned. The Puno region has been one of the hardest hit by the brutal police and military repression, which has left close to 50 demonstrators killed and hundreds injured since the ousting of the former president, Pedro Castillo, on December the 7th. Meanwhile, late on Tuesday night in Ayacucho, people also rallied as they joined the march towards the capital city. Meanwhile, Peruvian Main Workers Union called for a national strike for Thursday, January 19th, to demand the immediate resignation of appointed President Dina Boluarte, together with early elections and a constituted assembly. The main rally will take place in the May 2nd Square in Lima at 4 p.m. local time. The strike is an initiative agreed by the Peruvian General Confederation of Workers and the National Assembly of the Peoples. Union workers and social activists from all over the country have arrived in Lima to join in. Bolivia's public prosecutor's office decided on Tuesday to expand the criminal proceedings against former de facto president Janine Añez. Judicial authorities have now included Añez in the Sincara case for allegedly committing the crimes of genocide, homicide and serious and light injuries during the 2019 coup d'etat. The accusation against the former de facto president is focused on the issues of the Supreme Decree 4078 on November 14, 2019, which exempted the military and the police from criminal responsibility for their actions in the massacres of Senkara and Sakawa. In view of these events, the former senator will be judged by Articles 138, 251, and 271 of the Bolivian Penal Code. During the events of November 19, 2019, military and police forces repressed and attacked the civilian population, leaving at least 10 dead and more than 30 injured. Bolivian Communicator Minister Gabriel Alcón said on Tuesday that the President Luis Arce will attend the 7th Latin American and Caribbean States Community Summit, CELAC, by its acronym in Spanish, to be held in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Alcón said that the President's agenda in Buenos Aires will be announced in the coming days. CELAC is an intergovernmental platform for dialogue and political coordination set up in 2010. It is made up of 33 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. At the present, Argentina holds its pro-temporary presidency. The novelty of this summit will be the return of Brazil to the CELAC, formalized by Lula da Silva's government after former President Jair Bolsonaro had withdrawn from it in January 2020. The Colombian government and the National Liberation Army, the ELN, agreed to hold an extraordinary meeting in Venezuela on Wednesday. This is to try to overcome the growing tensions generated during the last days, which have put recent peace talks in crisis. The guerrilla group said that they will establish clarities to overcome the situation and try to advance towards the harmonious continuity of the second cycle of talks. 
Monsignor Hector Fabio Genao, the delegate of the Colombian Episcopal Conference for the Peace Dialogues with the ELN, declared that the fact that both parties agreed to hold the extraordinary meeting before the new cycle of talks in Mexico raises the level of importance of the meeting and shows the good faith of both parties in their search for a joint solution. On Wednesday, Antigua and Barbuda holds legislative elections to renew the Senate and the House of Representatives. The election day will take place until 6 p.m. local time, with over 60,000 citizens expected to vote. Josephine Tamay, the chief elections officer of the Belize Department of Elections and Boundaries, will lead an electoral observation mission sent to the Caribbean community. This will be done alongside a Commonwealth Observer Group that will assess the overall development of the election and make recommendations to strengthen the electoral process in the country. Currently, the main runners are Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party, led by Gaston Browning, which has 15 of 17 seats in the House of Representatives, and the Progressive Party, which ruled the country from 2004 to 2014, and has Jamel Pringle as its only representative in Parliament. Also participating in the elections are the Barbuda People's Movement and the Democratic National Alliance, which sponsors 16 candidates. Let's take a short break now, but first, remember you can follow us on our TikTok account at Telesur English, in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates and more. Other studies coming up, stay with us. Welcome back. The Brazilian government dismissed 43 military personnel who were working at the presidential residence last January the 8th when a group of Bolsonaro supporters stormed governmental premises. The Ministry of the General Secretariat of the Presidency decided on the dismissal of the armed forces members who were part of the coordination of administration of the Alvorada Palace in Brasilia. Among the dismissed military personnel are members of the Institutional Security Cabinet, who will be relocated to other functions within the armed forces. Most dismissals affect lower ranks, such as soldiers, corporals, and sergeants in the Navy, Air Force, and Army, including seven officers. Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva has indicated the existence of collusion, noting that the doors of the Planalto Palace were opened from the inside because they were not broken. El Salvador's president, Nayib Bukele, stated on Tuesday that nearly 3,000 people have been released from prison after being found innocent of criminal charges. During his speech at the inauguration of an urban center in the community of Mexicanos on the outskirts of the capital San Salvador, Bukele also stated that 58,000 people were still in prison. El Salvador has put in place an emergency regime in March 2022 as part of an alleged fight against gangs within natural territory. However, international human rights bodies, along with national social organizations, have severely criticized the measure, which has so far been extended by the government 10 times and allows security forces to detain suspects without a specific court order. As part of these operations, 61,000 people have been arrested, of whom 3,000 have been released due to lack of criminal responsibility. Let's go to other topics. The train drivers union in the United Kingdom will go on strike in February to demand better working conditions and higher wages. The strike will take place from February the 1st to February the 3rd and will be joined by the teachers and about 100,000 public sector workers, including the border force personnel. The union says that the salary adjustment proposed by the government is unacceptable due to the attached conditions. They point out that the proposal is an attempt to obtain hundreds of millions of pounds of productivity for a 20% wage cut. In recent weeks, other sectors such as nurses and ambulance workers have partially stopped their activities in demand of better working conditions.
And the National Police of Ukraine reported on Wednesday that the Interior Minister, Denis Monastrivsky, and other senior officials of the ministry were killed when the helicopter in which they were traveling crashed in the city of Rovary in Kiev. The head of the National Police of Ukraine, Igor Kilimenko, reported that in addition to Minister Monastrivsky, the first deputy had Eugenie Jenin and the State Secretary of Internal Affairs, Yuri Lubokiv, were also killed. Klimenko said that at least 18 people died when the helicopter crashed near a kindergarten and an apartment building. The police authorities said that among the dead are two children and at least 29 people are hospitalized, including 15 minors. According to officials, the inspection of the site continues as authorities are investigating whether it was sabotage, technical failure or pilot error. Now we move on to other topics. The Russian ambassador to the United Nations, Vasily Nubenzia, has denounced at the Security Council of the organization the project of President Vladimir Zelensky to completely eliminate the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Based on reliable reports, the Russian diplomat assured that Kiev will discriminate against communities and believers, will try to strip the Orthodox Church of its historical and legal name, and even when the time comes, it will eliminate it completely. During his speech, he explained that Ukraine is on the verge of a large-scale inter-confessional conflict, never seen in the history of Europe, and in view of the seriousness of the crisis, the ambassador strongly reproached his colleagues for their silence. In addition, the Russian ambassador Nubenzia rejects the stance taken by the West, claiming that it has been adding fuel to the fire by turning a blind eye to Kiev's actions in the last few years. Also, what I would like to ask to the Western power who respond to Kiev, who claim to defend freedom of religion and human rights, how long will they continue to turn a blind eye to the action of Kiev? in the fact that it is plunging the country into a religious crisis. How long will they continue to turn a blind eye to this dictatorship? It is a rhetorical question. Of course, they have not only turned a blind eye, but they have been adding fuel to the fire over the last decades, especially in the last few years. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. In Japan, the Tokyo's High Court upheld on Wednesday the acquittal of three former executives from the Fukushima nuclear plant, again clearing them a professional negligence over the 2011 nuclear disaster. The court was upheld in non-guilty verdict in the only criminal trial regarding the world's worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl. The executives of the Tokyo Electric Power Company had been charged with responsibility for the deaths of more than 40 hospitalized patients who had to be evacuated following the nuclear disaster after an enormous tsunami that saw waves as high as 14 meters overwhelms the plant. However, the Tokyo District Court said in 2019 that they could not have predicted the magnitude of the catastrophe. The tsunami left 18,500 people dead or missing, but no direct deaths were recorded from the nuclear accident, which forced evacuations and left parts of the surrounding area uninhabitable. On Wednesday, the president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, said that he intends to advance the next general elections once month to May 14th. The announcement sets the stage for what some analysts view as Turkey's most consequential voting generations. Erdogan and his Islamic-rooted party have ruled Turkey for two decades that have seen years of economic booms. His opposition enters the campaign divided over most issues, from policy to strategy, and has not agreed on a candidate to field against Erdogan. Turkey's next general election is officially due to be held on June 18th.
In Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, the armed conflicts between the government forces and the rebel group M23 has forced many refugees to seek shelter at the Virunga National Park. The National Park, home to a spectacular species of wildlife, finds itself trapped in the midst of the insurgency by M23 rebels accused of being supported by Rwanda. Under the helpless gaze of the authorities, the displaced are forced to invade the park, cutting down trees for firewood and charcoal. Refugees denounce that humanitarian aid has not yet arrived, so they turn to the park's resources to avoid starvation. Aside from the displaced, the park authorities have to deal with the local armed militias. In less than two months, more than 500 acres of forest have been razed to the stumps. And the South African government asked the United States to withdraw the anti-Russian bill in Africa. During an interview, South African Foreign Minister Naledi Pander said that the bill to combat Russian activity in Africa is against international law and should be withdrawn. She also pointed out that the legislation has not yet been passed and is scheduled to be debated in the United States Senate. Thus, the bill was first introduced in the House of Representatives in late March and passed a month later by a large bipartisan majority. The head of South African diplomacy signaled to the United States her desire for a review of the unilateral sanctions that affect the interests of many countries. Now we move on to other topics. Tsunami warnings have been issued in the Pacific Ocean coasts after an earthquake of magnitude 7.1 was registered this Wednesday in the Molucan Sea, where more than 150 kilometers from Indonesia. According to the United States Geological Survey, the epicenter of the powerful tremor was located 150 kilometers northwest of the Indonesian island of Halmahera and a 60 kilometers deep. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center has issued a warning for possible tsunami waves, while Indonesia's meteorological agency did not issue a tsunami warning, but alerted nearby residents of possible aftershocks. Indonesia often experiences intense seismic and volcanic activity due to its location on the Pacific Ring of Fire, where tectonic plates collide. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at jealousyofenglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Jealousy English, I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.